Good evening, Wool Gatherers, and welcome to episode 126 of Wanderings and Wool Gathering. On tonight's episode, we're going to look at the new Billy Idol EP called The Cage. It's four songs. We're going to check that out. We're going to talk about Smashing Pumpkins. They've got an enormous rock opera on the way, and it's coming out bit by bit. We're going to discuss that a little bit. Uh, we're going to do a fun Lester Bangs inspired challenge to try to stump Metalhead, and we all know how hard that can be. Not his head, the challenge. And we're going to talk about issues 17 and 18 of Sandman. And those, if you were watching the show, were the uh, last episode that was split in half. One about the cats, one about Calliope. And those are the two issues we're going to tackle tonight in Sandman. And without further ado, joining me is none other than Metalhead Monday. Step inside into his mind. It's boy band time. It's Metalhead Monday. There he is. is uh, it hard? It's pretty hard too. So, and, you know. Yeah. I wasn't talking about your skull, but that's okay. <laughs> but you could have been. I could have been. I could have been, but I wasn't. So, oh my goodness, Sunday night coming to you live from K Town. We've got a lot of fun stuff to talk about tonight. Hope so. I mean, I hope yeah. it's fun. We have a lot of stuff. Whether it's fun or not, we'll see. Well, it might be fun for us, maybe nobody else, but <laughs> hey, they're not paying me. So when they start paying That's me, right. then they can dictate what I say on the show. <laughs> but um, no, I think it'll be fun. I, it's one of those coming into, I haven't, I didn't hate anything that we listened to this weekend. So that's always a bonus. It's not yeah. Tony's version of Florida or your <laughs> Fiona. So we are there. And, did uh, I send, did I send you guys the picture of that? Neil Young book that I found. Mm -hmm. Okay. I couldn't remember. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Cause totally Tony given, chimed in. <laughs> totally given that to him for Christmas. He's earned it. He's earned it <laughs> after that episode. I think it's basically, it's just a bunch of articles on Neil Young articles and interviews from Rolling Stone magazine for over the years. Any of them about Florida? Or uh, no, it was way before that. That books, <laughs> it, it's not new. So. Gotcha. Well, maybe Tony will give that a shot. No, he won't. <laughs> he will not. All right. We're going to kick off tonight's show with Lester Bang's Inspired Challenge. I'm going to read Mr. Mundy a review. I'm going to pull out the pertinence, and he's going to tell me the band or the album or both that it's talking about. I'm going to try. I know. I, well, I think there's a couple. There's definitely some giveaways. If you pick up, know what I mean? Okay. So here we go. See if I can pick up what you're putting down. I know. I got to I gotta pull out the pertinence, though. That's where it's going to be kind of funky. <laughs> so, okay. On um, this band's previous album, the breakthrough title of the album was a jaunty genre hopping overview of the band's career. This follow-up is a bleak meditation containing few obvious singles. Every song is in a minor key, and cold, dark, and drowning images pervade the lyrics. Okay, hmm. that's a start. In the lead singer's world, even good relationships are shot through with morbid overtones, and failed ones are the end of the world. He treats both with the same resigned melancholy. Melancholy is not a hint. <laughs> so don't go down that road. <laughs> Since we're talking about the pumpkins tonight, I want to fool you on that one. Uh, not coincidentally, the most upbeat song is also the shortest. And even then, this song describes an only temporary respite from misery. So before I read the last little bit, hopefully to tip you off, you got any ideas? I mean, there's a couple that are coming to mind. My first, uh, as much as you're talking about how uh, how much of a downer this is, I, I mean, my first inclination would be to say the Cure. Okay, not a bad guess. <laughs> you got a you got a record in mind? Uh, no, because I don't. I they're one of those bands where I don't have like every single record memorized. I don't. It became it wasn't well received in the beginning, but it became one of their most popular. Yeah, I don't know. I, I'm not. No titles are coming to mind. 
Yeah, disintegration. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, with love song. Yeah, <laughs> being the temporary temporary respite from misery. Um, yeah. So this um, review actually was positive <laughs> after all that. Uh, it says, despite the title, disintegration hangs together beautifully, creating and sustaining a mood of thoroughly self-absorbed gloom that goes on to kind of, so, yeah, you had The Cure, you could have had The Smiths or that Morrissey was that, or something, yeah. you know? <laughs> they also came to mind. Yep. Yeah, we got another one. Gosh, dang it. Love The Cure. Yeah, they're amazing. I cannot wait for the new record. They've been hinting for a long time. but long um, time. So who knows when we're going to get one, but I hopefully uh, I hope we get one soon. Yep. Um, apparently he's struggling to write lyrics, possibly. Yeah, um, I mean, you know, been doing it a long time. Maybe he's tapped out. Maybe he needs to find himself a muse. But boom. <laughs> like, do you have anyone in mind, Calliope? Oh, I hear Calliope's available. I do too. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> somebody said the Smiths. No, but a great guess. I mean, they came to mind for me. So Yeah, it's definitely one of those that could fit in there for sure. Yeah. They were my second guess. Yep. Well, you would have been on point with that. So good guess, Facebook user. And I know that's not my daughter because she wouldn't know the Smiths. Okay. She always sneaks in here. So, okay. Well... That was fun, and we'll try to do another one next week or even a larger challenge. We'll see how that goes. But we need to get started with Billy Idol. Yeah. And his new EP called The Cage. Yep. And so four songs, so there's not a ton here. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's only 14 minutes in yeah. total. So it was easy to listen to this a bunch of times and kind of get a good feel for it. Uh, for me... Billy Idol was the first concert I ever went to. I forgot about that. Yeah. So, yeah. So that was, it's kind of funny. He opened actually for um, Minute, Minute Work. work for yeah. Minute Work, yeah. Um, early 80s. I think I was 10 or 11. Um, this was probably right after he broke off with Generation X. So his first solo album came out in like 82. Yeah, so. 81 um, was Generation X and then he did a solo Mm -hmm. And his most popular song, or one of Dancing With Myself, was actually a Generation X song Yes, um, prior to him going solo. And I remember I had a Walkman, because who didn't? And I had a paper route, and I had a Generation X cassette. And I nice. listened to that a lot. Very cool. Um, yeah, Ready, Steady, Go, Youth, 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 all those I never, great ones. Yeah, I never, I, I guess I'm like just a little bit younger than you, but I just young enough that I never heard of Generation X until after I was a Billy Idol fan. And, you know, then I found out about them. And yeah, good stuff for sure. Yeah, I think he was kind of in charge of Generation X because he fired two members of the band and replaced them prior to uh, some of their better stuff coming out late 80s. So, <laughs> But anyway, we're not here to talk about Generation X. We're here to talk about Billy Idol and The Cage. So what are your first impressions? Uh, well, my first impression was the title track and lead-off song, Cage, because uh, I saw a couple weeks ago... I. Uh, his uh, video for the song just popped up into my YouTube recommends. And I was like, Oh cool. New Billy Idol. And I'm a Billy Idol fan. So I'll always check out whatever he's putting out. And I really like the song videos. You know, there's not a lot to it. It's kind of one of those where they do. It's him on kind of a pedestal in this room. I think the room might be all red. And it's one of those where he like kind of like strikes a pose and then it pauses and it does the spin. Oh, yeah. You yeah. know, the 360 mm -hmm. cameras or whatever. So it's kind of like that and just kind of a mostly a performance video, you know, with a couple of cool little visuals. But uh, good song. I really like the song. Um, it's super catchy chorus. Uh, it's got some solid grooves. Uh, Steve Stevens sounds great mm -hmm. on the solos. And uh, yeah, I, I have no complaints. I think it's pretty, pretty solid opener, even, even though I, it, 
you know, talk about openers and closers on a four song EP. I and, mean, <laughs> you know, it's, but this is, I mean, it definitely is a good solid opener if he was doing a longer album. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. It's uh, Billy Idol through and through. Yeah. And um, his voice still sounds fantastic. I know awesome. he's mid sixties or whatever, but he sounds great. Yeah. Chorus, super catchy. Sounds good. Uh, song prompted by COVID, mm -hmm. um, which is the cage. And then, but he extrapolated a little bit and said that it was, uh, it goes beyond just COVID. It could be any way that somebody feels like society is constraining you. So okay. that was the yeah. meaning behind the cage and the lyrics support that. It's not yeah. super heavy or anything, but um, definitely good. And like, yeah, I agree with you. If this would have been a full album, that would have been a great opener. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Grabs your attention, kept my attention, you know, catchy enough to, you know, I'm, humming the melody after mm -hmm. it's over, you know, <laughs> it, it's a good song. Yeah. Uh, second song running from the ghost. Another interesting, good song. I thought, what'd you think? Um, yeah, I, I liked this one a lot. There's, um, Billy sounds really cool in the intro. Um, and it has, once it kicks into the groove, it's got kind of a, uh, like a cool, like, kind of a galloping drum mm -hmm. beat you know nothing nothing too crazy but it's you know sets a nice groove um the uh when it kind of kicks into it, it changes gears and it kicks into this uh i don't know this you know the guitar lick whatever you want to call that I heard that the first time I heard it, I'm like, oh my God, this sounds so much like something else. But, and I was racking my brain trying to place it. And just today I finally, it dawned on me. I'm like, oh my God, it's Avenged Sevenfold. Which song is it? <laughs> and I, and I went and it's, it's Hail to the King. Like it's almost exactly the same thing. It's very, very similar to the opening riff in Hail to the King. Um, so, it is, yeah, it's almost exact. And when you yeah. sent me the text and said, "Did that? Does this remind you of anything we've heard recently?" It took me about five seconds to respond. Yeah, yeah. Uh, run it, running from the ghost. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. And it's a cool song because it starts off and it's really the focus is slow. The focus is on his voice. It's a little gravelly, but there's still like a smooth coolness mm -hmm. to it. Yeah, and then, um, and, and again, the an interesting topic talking about drug addiction in the seventies and eighties, running from that. Yeah. And I'm sure that was really prevalent in England when they were starting off and the punk movement and all of that. So, yeah, the lyrics like, the, you know, he, he says running from the ghost and the ghost for me, like listening to that, like what you said, kind of the ghost evokes like your your former self and, you know, how you used to act and be, and uh, you know, looking back, you're always kind of running from that and trying to stay ahead of it. Solid, solid song. I like that one a lot. I will say, I, I think with the Avenged Sevenfold thing, I think uh, it might be nice if Steve Stevens would buy those guys dinner or something as a thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would agree on that one. I, it is so close. It is so close. I didn't listen to them. Like it almost, I almost like to just play like five seconds and then do the other five and go back yeah. and forth just to kind of pick it yeah. up. I would do that right now, but it would kick us off of YouTube, right? So. <laughs> Which we don't need. Uh, third song, "Rebel Like You." Mm -hmm. um, okay, so the first couple times I heard this, I thought, okay, now we're, we're pushing it a little bit because you know Billy is the rebel or whatever. You know, he's got rebel yell yeah. and he's known for that stuff. And I'm like, this yeah. is kind of corny. I had and the same I... same idea I, when I saw the title. I was like, mm, are we using "Rebel" again? Okay, <laughs> but then when I found out it was about his granddaughter. Oh, and she yeah. dressed up like him and showed up at the concert. Um, and so she dressed up like the Dancing With Myself video. I thought, okay, this is kind of cool now. It's kind of cute. I can yeah. I can deal with it. He is, he's actually fun to follow on Instagram because you see him. Uh, he posts videos and pictures of his little granddaughter all the time. <laughs> it's so <laughs> cute. He absolutely loves being a grandfather, and it's it's so cute to watch. Well, so I, I've softened on the song. I don't love it as a song. Yeah, I, I like it more knowing the meaning behind it. I uh, it, I mean, it's a solid groove. Uh, I love his vocals in this song. Actually, he sounds fantastic. Mm -hmm. At you know his 
voice and the singing he, he's knocks it out of the park um it's uh it's catchy enough it's you know it's got a, it's a little bit of a sing-along mm -hmm. but um yeah i mean you know it's good it's not great it's fun yep miss nobody the next song complete change of direction yes i really appreciated that um it was totally different from anything else on the record and i Very really funky. liked it yeah it definitely had a funk vibe to it which is yeah. was so cool and um it's about somebody who's living on the street. Yeah. Um, Miss nobody. Yeah. Yeah. The lyrics are, yeah. I mean, it evokes that pretty, pretty easily. Um, like I said, it's a pretty funky. Um, I don't love the, I guess you'd call it kind of a pseudo rap delivery in the, mm -hmm. in the verses. Uh, I, I love the chorus though, but mm -hmm. really, really powerful vocals on the chorus, but. It's fun. I mean, I don't hate it. Yeah, the, the verses didn't bother me at all, just because I felt like somebody at his age could just fall into a rut and just keep kind of giving us what we know, what we like yeah. from Billy Idol. And I thought thought this song was fresh, and it was kind of a break from that, and so I really appreciated that. Um, yeah. Made me like that a little bit more. And as an album closer, <laughs> not really an album closer, because I mean, you know, we yeah. still have four or five more songs to go, really. Yeah. But um, So anyway, I would say for me, if I were to judge this as an album, I would probably give it about a three and a half, three, seven, five out of five. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I think I will listen a few more times. Yeah. Uh, same pretty much. Uh, I was at three, seven, five. I'll probably listen to it some more. It's only, I mean, you know, it's like 15 minutes out of your day. Right. That's right. So, uh, and it, it's, I like the songs are different enough that it, keeps your attention and i mean even the subject matter on each song is different so he's obviously you know he's still got it he's still finding inspiration all around him and uh steve stevens and the band sound great so i i, I really dug it but yeah 375 cool i guess we'll just go with the doubled up 375 that means that if you haven't heard it yet you should probably take a listen everybody it would be worth your effort. If you in any way have liked Billy Idol through the oh, years, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. think you'll dig this. And um, yeah. I would, if he came around again, I would probably go see him live. Oh, I would too. I know. Yeah. Uh, yeah my wife would totally be down for that. It'd be my 40th anniversary of seeing <laughs> Billy. <laughs> he, we, he performed on the tennis courts at the Indianapolis tennis center. Wow. That's, That's where that was. Yeah, that was cool. So small and uh, close. It was nice. All right. Well, we normally don't do two musical things like this on the show, but we just wanted to touch briefly on Smashing Pumpkins with their announcement this week. Yep. Lots of stuff going on. The new album called Autumn, which is pronounced Autumn. I could I, at first I thought a tum. What's going on? Uh, but it's yeah. actually Autumn. He's just spelled it differently because it's Billy, and he is describing this as a rock opera in three parts. It's thirty-three songs. And it will complete the trilogy started off with Melancholy in 1995 and then Machina in 2000. So this will be the third of the trilogy. And it will be released on November 15th will be the Act 1. January 31st will be Act 2. April 21st will be Act 3. And if you want to get the whole package in a box set, it's like 229 bucks, And it comes Whoa. out in April. Um, I'm probably not going to, and I, you know, it's one of my all time favorite bands, but I'm not sold yet. I got to be sold on this because after sir, I'm not certain that I'm going yeah. to want to spend 220 bucks on it. Yeah. Yeah. Sir was, uh, yeah, it's kind of hit or miss definitely for me. And it was you, all be, over. you being the pumpkins fan, like I, for, Yeah. <laughs> I, they just go down the road and I love that he wants to be different and he wants to evolve mm -hmm. and change I just don't want all that electronica I don't want all the keyboard and the synths uh, part of what I loved about their early work especially and probably all the way up through Machina was all that heavy layered guitar and the mm -hmm. grooves that he created with those so I will say having listened to Beguiled um, I do like that little chuggy groove that this song has. I, I think if we can get, if that's an indication of more of what we're going to get, 
I'm on board completely. Yeah, Beguiled was definitely my favorite of the three. Um, I mean, obviously, I'm the metalhead, so I appreciate some heavy guitars. But uh, And I think my favorite song from Smashing Pumpkins is one of their heavier songs, Zero. So, mm-hmm. um, so yeah, I, I Beguiled was definitely my favorite of the three. I guess there was a fourth one, but I did not hear the fourth one. Um, I haven't listened to all the pods yet, so I'm not sure if it was on the last podcast. Um, on Spotify, there's only the two episodes up. Oh, so maybe I wonder where people got it then. I don't know. Uh, so the other one being, and they did play this on uh, the podcast, was Butterfly Suite. Mm-hmm. Um, it also is on Act One. I think all of these are. And for me, this one it was like nice and breezy, and it kind of felt like Sir to a certain okay. point. And then when the chorus kicked in, it kind of built to a point where I felt like it really fit in neatly with that Machina era. Um, so I'm hoping that that is what we're going to get. I mean, I hope they're connecting it a little bit since it's the trilogy of the three. But we'll see. Did you like Butterfly Suite? Uh, I did. Um, <clears throat> and... It, like both of those podcasts were released on the same day, I think. So I didn't really know if there was a particular order to listen to them in. Um, and it turns out the autumn is like the lead off track, I guess, yes. like, a, like an instrumental, instrumental kind of intro. And then they said, uh, what is it? Butterfly wings. Is that what it's called? What is it? Butterfly sweet. Butterfly sweet. Um, that one is the like first first track. Billy said the first track with lyrics, so it's like so that's the first two songs. Yeah. Um, and I think they work better that way. I listen to them in the reverse order. So mm-hmm. like Autumn is a cool, it's a cool you know instrumental intro. If for it, it works for what it is, mm-hmm. sounds great. The you know, the musicianship's really on point, uh, you know, it's smashing pumpkins. So um, everybody knows what they're doing. Uh, and that, I think I would like to hear them back to back the one as a lead in to the other, but yeah, I enjoyed all three of these songs. I, so far so good for me. Yeah, I agree. It reminds me of the start of melancholy with the piano intro that then goes into tonight, tonight. I think the two of them work really well together and I think what you're saying is right, that instrumental. Mm-hmm. And I really like those nice little drum rolls in the instrumental. And then it had, and it did have keyboard, but for some reason, I don't know, it felt like it was important, like we were getting ready to go on a journey or something important was about to happen. Yeah. So I hope that is the case. But yeah, I like that. I like Butterfly Suite and uh, and Beguiled, I thought was really good. The live version on Fallon on Friday mm-hmm. night was good. Okay. And that crazy TikTok video. I don't know if you saw that with that outfit not he was wearing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I watched it live and uh, whoo, he was in a quite the outfit. Um, yeah, uh, you know, Billy likes to show off every now and then. I mean, <laughs> he, he's a big fan and uh, I guess at one point uh, kind of an entrepreneur in the wrestling, pro wrestling business. So he owns you know. NWA. Yes. So, you know, he, he appreciates the theatrics. So, but yeah, uh, yeah, this is still, it's uh, still Jimmy and James with him, right? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Darcy didn't return. She'll never be. Well, yeah. I mean, when we saw him a few years ago, that was, you know, uh, apparently what she's gone on record as saying there, she probably won't ever. Right. Um, Yeah. Yeah. I'm kidding. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think there are just some rifts there that are too deep to overcome. Yeah, bad blood. So, I mean, I wish she would. I'd like to see the whole band back together. But was she ever the most important part? No. I mean, it's mean, you know. always flowed from Billy and Jimmy. So Yeah. But anyway, I'm excited. So November 15th, that will be released. So I assume shortly after that, we'll probably be reviewing that. Absolutely. That'll be here before you know it. I mean, it's flying right now. So we're only about seven <laughs> yeah. weeks away. All right. Well, that concludes the musical portion of tonight and leads us to, guess what? Sandman. (laughs) Number 17, which is actually the reverse order of the TV shows. 
Yes, it is right. Yeah. So, yeah. so it's, these are both covered in the uh, bonus kind of eleventh episode of Sandman. So uh, that little surprise episode we got, like what, a couple weeks, a week or two later after it debuted. Yeah, it just showed up with no fanfare. Yeah, so that's both of these issues are covered in that episode. So yeah. If you've seen the show, that's what we're discussing. Very strange. Well, the, the cat issue is very strange. Calliope is like just a cool kind of like a monkey's paw kind of thing. Yeah. Short story, one issue. Um, and it just feels full. Like when people talk about how you know, comics have to go in these arcs of five to six issues or whatever. This one did it in one and did it beautifully. Yeah, man. yeah this is, uh, that's the great thing about Sandman is you have the, the arcs that are mostly, I think six issues. Um, I'd have to look to be sure, but most yeah. of them are about six, you know, five to seven is the kind of the industry standard nowadays. Because they be want to, the they trade. Wanna, yes, they want to put the stories in the trade paperbacks. So, um, but yeah, this Sandman is just full of these little one issue stories, kind of weave throughout everything. And here we've got a couple, we've got a couple here, and we have one next week or whenever we cover that the next issue too. So, yeah, pretty cool. Um, we won't go page by page, but. We'll hit all the big details. I was uh, <laughs> at first, so I hadn't watched it yet. So okay. when I was reading this, I it was totally you know fresh for me, and yeah. it was just interesting that we're talking about a hairball. Yeah, for the, for the entire first page, I'm like, um, okay, I'm yeah. sure there's some significance, but what uh, do they call that? A bezor trichino bezor. Yeah, <laughs> with this, which is the hair, the hair version. Yeah. <laughs> very, very strange. And I didn't know that the Rapunzel syndrome was actually a real thing where kids eat their own hair. Oh, yeah. And it yeah, builds yeah. up in there. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. I always just thought it was a feline thing. So, nope. Little did I know, huh? There are, yeah, there's all kinds of, I mean, they call them disorders, but there are all kinds of little mental disorders or tics or whatever where people get obsessed with eating different things. And yeah. The hair one is probably more common than you would think. Yeah. Wow. All right. Well, so from the, oh, well, I guess we should go back a little bit. Um, so why is the Bezor important? And so it's going to be an offering mm -hmm. uh, to somebody. And by the way, if we're going to connect these two, when I was watching the episode, Mm -hmm. And he goes to take this to, um, what was his name? Um, Erasmus. Erasmus, yeah. I thought, oh my God, it's Derek Jacoby. He <laughs> is amazing. That guy is like one of the best Shakespearean actors. And he was in all of Kenneth Branagh's movies. And um, absolutely amazing. So I was so happy when he popped up on the screen. Yeah. Get a little Erasmus. The, uh, the main... Who plays uh, Rick Haddock in the thing? I can't remember his name, but he's like a very well-respected British actor. Yeah, I know he was in like some Doctor Who stuff. That's where I first saw him. See, I, I did not recognize him. He looked familiar, but I couldn't place it. So yeah, I can't. I don't know. But uh, he's a a struggling writer yes. um, who has written one novel and is sort of in trouble. His publishing company is looking for him to produce something else. Mm -hmm. And he has writer's block. He cannot produce a thing. So um, he's run out of ideas. So Mr. Maddock is going for help from Erasmus. And that's why he needs that crazy hairball. Yeah, we don't get the the backstory of how he connected to Erasmus Fry and how he, mm -hmm. you know, knows about Calliope or anything like that. Like We don't know how that happened, but... So we're kind of in the middle of the story where he's trying to acquire a muse from Erasmus. And mm -hmm. Erasmus kind of sits him down and tells him the story of how he found her and all of that. And so it's pretty cool. 
Yeah, and I don't think necessarily anybody really cares because the real meat here is once he gets to Calliope, the downfall yes. of this guy and what happens. And yeah, you knew he was going to abuse it. Um, you, once you taste that, um, I guess he was very prolific and he was just producing thing after thing. There's no way in the world he was going to give her up because um, she was gaining him riches. So yeah, he knew that was coming. And this is kind of where I would like to take a second and uh, recognize the art of Mr. Kelly Jones. Yep. Uh, who has a very distinct style, um, which is, I mean, very much on display here. I want to say actually the first um, statue that DC put out of Dream was a Kelly Jones statue. Hmm. And it's kind of like the long and lean, you know, with the white face and the big hair and like the flowing robes. And I'm pretty sure it was Kelly Jones design. But yeah. this first you turn the page and you get like this first image of Calliope. It, you know, she's nude and she's very shadowed and long and lean. And I mean, that's just Kelly Jones in his prime. It's a beautiful image. My favorite pages in the entire issue was that page mm -hmm. they were all the ones that were almost entirely black mm -hmm. um, and then you've got the white outlines of like in this case it's her full body um there was another one where she's laying down sideways you've got the um the bed beside her and you've got the window yeah the rest of it is black yeah and there's another cr super cool one of a face i think um oh what the heck? Well, there's a couple of the, <laughs> I know, I, I, I just, when I was looking at it, I was like, oh my God, I love that. And I, I can't remember which page it was. I should have written down the page or whatever. Yeah. But, um, it was super cool. But And the so way he, he draws Dream. Yes. Is excellent because it's all very dark shadowy. Yeah. But this is where, you know, we kind of were introduced to Calliope and she's, uh, you know, Erasmus gives her tells her I, I'm giving you to this man so you're his now and she said but you said you were going to let me go and it's like uh, writers are liars you know yes. you can't trust what is that oh you said put not your trust in princes my dear I'm like ah what a dick <laughs> yeah that is I think that's from Psalms actually yeah that line um, I knew I mean it's written in italics so I assumed it was from something else yeah. but it's just, you know, something like a guy like that would say. But yeah, the writers are liars, my dear. Surely you've realized that by now. Yeah. And so you, you kind of get there's that similarity between her and Dream because he was trapped then for 100 years. She's trapped for right. 60, I think, at this point. And I think he was even trapped during this, wasn't he? During hers um, at the same time? He, yes. Um, so yeah, he, when, uh, she is changing hands is kind of right at like a few years before dream is released, I think. Cause then like, you know, Richard Haddock tries, he starts taking advantage of her and starts writing his novel. And then she calls on the three fates mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, that's what they say that, there's nothing they can do to help her, but she should call on dream, which uh, she calls Oneros or they call mm -hmm. Oneros because they're wrapped up in the Greek. Right. Stuff. But, um, and uh, this is where we find out like she had, she is, was married to dream at one point and uh, you know, gave birth to his son um, which they don't really name here. No, I didn't get that um, either because I was expecting that to come back at some point. Like, yeah, they don't really will. name him anywhere in here. But um, so she was like, "Oh, I could never call on him," and they're like, "Well, he's trapped anyway." So, or uh, do they say that he's trapped, or they say uh, something about him being indisposed? I don't remember if they exactly say that he's trapped, but they're like, "He can't help you anyway." So, right. And then it shows shows there's a little flashback of how Erasmus caught her. And then we start, you know, you, you go to the there's the party scene that's in the episode where, you know, all the people are talking about his new book. And then then we go very quickly through a few years. It's like one panel every few months. 
and it kind of sees him all getting all these accomplishments and writing epic poems and a play and trying to, you know, he gets a movie deal and all this stuff while he's got uh, Calliope captured and is taking advantage of her being yeah. the muse. So what they say is, um, just like you, Calliope, your one-time admirer has been ensnared by mortals. There you go. While you're imprisoned in your tower, he is immured beneath the ground. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah, this guy gets crazy pro prolific. He is just killing it at every mm -hmm. angle. He's doing everything. He's a wanted man as far as, like, you know, he's going to direct. So, yeah, you just know. I mean, there's no way in hell he's going to give that up so that she can be free. Right. Unless someone mm -hmm. comes to her rescue. Hmm. I wonder who that might be. I love that the text in the book for him is always the same. Because when you first hear him, he's off panel. But the way that the text is done for you, you know it's Morpheus. Or in the case of when, and like the next one, he's the cat. You know how they come in different yeah. forms, whoever mm -hmm. can see. You always know it's him because of the text. Yes. they have. It's like the the blobby looking it's not a like a perfectly you know elliptical word balloon it's like kind of blobby looking and it's always black with the white text yeah it's kind of, kind of reversed yep. yeah love it so yeah he comes haddock comes home and dream is sitting there and he's like well who are you who let you in you know so he kind of uh lets him know that he should release calliope and that's where uh he says this is where yes so this is where he says that he needs her because he he needs the ideas he's run out of ideas without her so dream <laughs> i love this uh, you want ideas you want dreams you want stories then ideas you will have ideas in abundance and then he goes away <laughs> Care for what you wish for. Yeah. I like it because it goes to the next page and it shows Richard Haddock kind of like waking up from a dream. <laughs> and that's all he thinks it is. Um, yep. Yeah. Little does he know that he's about to be flooded with ideas. And I thought the uh, show did it really well. Yes. Um, which was really cool. And it follows the book and... Um, which I love. And so, yeah, he's got so many ideas. He can't get them all down. So he mm -hmm. ends up using his own blood and just gnarling up his fingers, writing yeah. down these ideas in blood, mm -hmm. uh, which is very, very cool. Um, and then basically begs, please go let her go. Go let her go. You know, he can't take it anymore. Mm -hmm. And um, he goes up there and the only thing left is the book yes. that was mentioned earlier. Which the, was Here Comes, Here comes a Candle yes. by Erasmus Fry. Yes. And uh yeah, and then I like it's it's almost they don't really show it, but it almost looks like uh Calliope and Dream are looking down on this scene. Like it mm -hmm. this last panel of the page, it shows like a like our POV is you see a, a rail, like a guardrail from a, like a, a balcony and then it cuts to Calliope and dream looking down. And then they start talking about, you know, he, what will you do now? And, you know, he, she basically says that, you know, years ago, you would not have done this for me. You would have left me to rot, you know, what's changed. And yeah, pretty cool. Yeah. And they, they're very cordial with each other. But uh, they will not strike up the relationship right here. Yeah. Um, he doesn't think it would be a good idea. Yeah. So, in, in this, so in, here they call him Oneros or however you say it. Um, I'm not sure how you pronounce that name. But in the show, they just stick with Morpheus. And that's yeah. probably way easier for the audience to understand. Yeah. Um, which makes sense, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Some of these pictures of Dream with the the gown and it's sort of frayed and looks all cool at the edges. Mm -hmm. um, really nice artwork. Yeah. And it closes out the same way the episode did with he's now Haddock is, you know, he can't hardly remember anything 
like he's gone from having so many ideas. He's basically ruined his hands and now he can't remember anything. Yep. No idea at all. That's what you get, Bella. <laughs> so, yeah, and that's how that one ends. And at the bottom of the page, it says a dream of a thousand cats is next, which just an odd, odd story. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's pretty cool. I think, I don't know. I like I, this would not have fit anywhere else in the series. I think it's just kind of one of those standalone stories that doesn't really go with anything else, but it kind of, I mean, you're literally delving into the, uh, I almost said dream lives. That's not right. It's a, uh, kind of you start like a, a very basic you know there's a couple they have a new kitten and they're putting it to bed and whatever and then and then it very quickly turns into there's a cat at the window talking to and it and the kitten are talking and it's so you kind of see like this uh secret world of cats you know when people aren't around yeah which isn't new anymore but it might have been a different like all the way back then it might have been a little fresher than now because we've got all these movies about the secret life of pets and all those kind of things but yeah you yeah. get this little inner world of cats and uh sneaking out helping them sneak out and yeah and it's uh, kind of like uh like they're you kind of you see all these cats kind of coming together and going to the same place and they're just on a kind of a a trip to this graveyard they're gathering in the graveyard to hear this you know older female cat speak like you don't you don't really get a sense of how word got out that that was going to happen but that you're just kind of going along with these cats as they all gather in this graveyard cats just know yeah i guess that's a cool double page spread Yes, it is and drawn. again we have kelly jones to thank for yeah. the imagery in this issue I, you know, it's interesting too. I wonder if if maybe scheduling these one offs was a way just to give as a Dringenberg, I can't remember his say his name, like a break, a break so yeah. that he could prepare for the next arc. And we've got these little standalones. Kelly Jones steps in, does those, mm -hmm. and he's got two months to get himself back into the flow. And that may be. Um, well, it's actually more than two because yeah, the, the next, next issue one. is not him either. I think it's Charles Vess. Okay. But, uh, but yeah, and then I mean, sooner or later, that doesn't really matter because he, they change artists so much, right? So, but uh, Kelly Jones, I think, is he's highly involved in some stuff coming up, and I think I think Dringenberg does come back for the next arc. But yeah, here soon after that, like they start kind of changing artists up a lot. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, you're right. It's Charles Vess on the next one. Yeah. So anyway, we're back to these crazy cats, which you just never think you're going to enjoy a story about cats. I don't like cats. I'm a dog guy, but uh, <laughs> it's beautifully rendered and it's a fun yeah. story until a bunch of cats get dumped into the creek. Yeah. So it's this <laughs> cat that they go to hear speak. Um, she's just kind of telling the story. You know, I was... Uh, a good cat and i loved being with my humans and you know there we had a good relationship and then she saw this beautiful male cat outside that was just kind of a almost like a bad bad boy you know she fell for the bad boy ragged of ear and dark of eye <laughs> yeah <laughs> she's like this purebred what's he call her a blue point siamese yes and, yeah. and she you know falls in with this uh this uh you know tom, tom cat. cat and uh ends up pregnant the, the husband of the couple is like you know, she's this, you know, super expensive thoroughbred cat. And these are little mongrels, you know, why, why did you let her out? You knew she was in heat and, you know, so he, the guy takes the kittens and puts them in a bag and throws them in the river. Yeah. Attached to a rock. Yeah. yeah. And she, you know, this broke her heart. She says, you know, she could, I felt them from afar in the dark as the cold water took them, felt them 
thresh and claw sightlessly felt them call me in their panic and their fear. And then they were gone. So these, the people broke her heart. So she kind of got a glimpse of how humans don't really care for cats. They, we are their property essentially. Yeah. They're not free. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So they're subordinate. um, Which I mean, you know, Hey, (laughs) but that's when we take a turn here. And so um, this is going to start like an epic journey that uh, a lot of heroes go on kind of thing. It's treacherous, mm-hmm. um, not likely. So runs into, at first I thought when I saw the wings, I didn't pay attention very much. I'm like, is that Matthew? But then mm-hmm. no, it's like a, uh, like the head of it is actually a skeleton on this bird. It's some kind of carrion or something. Yeah. And this is in the dream realm. Like the yes. cat is dreaming. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, and then just like with Matthew talking, they do the, the word balloon that's made of the lines that don't quite scratchy smoothly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and she, he says, Hey, there's nothing for you here. And he said, I've come here for justice. I've come for revelation. I have come for wisdom. Um, and then basically is told uh, no. Um, it says, but revelation, that's the providence of dream. And so, I was curious what, at this point what dream was going to look like. Yeah. I wasn't quite sure in here what form that might take. Um, Giant black cat. What else would it be? Kind of like a panther, but maybe. <laughs> um, yeah, Pretty it was more not. than just like your your family cat. It was bigger. I mean, and... kind of. Yeah, it's kind of like just a black cat, but a little kind of uh, not a smooth black cat. It's more kind of a fluffier black cat but it's big, way bigger than a normal cat. Um, Okay. So Neil says um, it's a huge black cat. I mean, huge. It's larger than a Panther, but it's a cat, not a Panther. Yeah. (laughs) The proportions are different. So just a ginormous black cat. Um, And so then we have the conversation. Well, I mean, the cat has to get there first and um, it wasn't an easy walk and cat was told it wouldn't be walk through the darkness, through the void where everything was sucked for me. Everything that makes me what I am. I guess it's one of those things before you can change or get to where you're going, you have to be stripped of everything that you are. And um, that's what happens. And um, then the warning comes beforehand. It says, but be warned dreams have their price. Yeah. She comes to the, guardians of the gate into the gate into the dream realm so that was pretty cool this is kind of the first time you hear them speak i think in the series we've seen them a couple of times but i don't remember them speaking before this yeah and that's kind of a common thing in stories like this you've got gatekeepers and sure um who might ask for answer riddle or some such Mm -hmm. or whatever but um not quite the same here but does gain audience with our big old black cat, which is I liked actually, I liked what she said. And you know, she's uh, I am a cat and I keep my own counsel. <laughs> I was yeah. like, yeah, that sounds like something a cat would yeah, say. <laughs> <laughs> and I might like you, I might not. I don't know. I'm cold and indifferent. <laughs> <clears throat> so um, and then it says, walk with me, little sister, and tell me why you have sought me out. And the cat wants to understand, wants to understand why they would take the children from her. Mm-hmm. Um, why do they live as they do? Why do they have to be subordinate? Um, so, and then I like the story that he tells, it's, you know, he, he tells her a story about how one, at one point cats did rule the world and they were, mm-hmm much larger than humans or or actually they were yeah they were the cats were larger and the humans were like cat size and you know and then they they dominated the humans even hunted them and then one day one human had a dream that they ruled the world and the cats were subordinate to them and we should all have this dream. And if we all dream this together, we can make it a reality. And that's basically what happens. He touches on a few times, even in the, 
I think it was in the Calliope issue as well. He touches on the um, idea where here it's this guy saying dream shaped the world. Right. And in the Calliope issue, I think it was more um, they, they, that was something they called dream was the shaper of worlds or mm-hmm. something like that or something along that line. But then so all these people have this same dream at the same time and then they wake up and reality's changed and it's like our world. It's people are the dominant, you know, creatures and cats are small and subordinate and all that stuff. It seems like it's almost a message that goes beyond the page when it says, um, I don't know how many it will take, but we must dream it. And if enough of us dream it, it will happen. It's almost like, Mm -hmm changing the world in general. If you get enough people together with a common purpose, you can make change. I don't know. Yeah. That was part of what he was thinking, but yeah. Um, I, I like that. And then in the, it's been a, a while since we've watched that episode. Didn't it get to that point a lot faster with the cats being big? It seemed like that happened very quickly in the episode. I don't know. Yeah, I'd have to go back and watch it now. I and feel this- like it followed this fairly closely. But it was, I mean, that was kind of half an hour, like it was half of the episode. So I think it probably did move a little quicker. But I think it was even know. shorter because the last episode or the uh, Calliope one was 45 minutes. Okay. So maybe that's why it felt like that. It was just shorter in general. Yeah. Um, but this had the uh, page that I was thinking of where it's entirely black, except for the cat's eyes and the teeth. Yes. And the moon to the side. Yeah. I thought that was very cool. Yeah. That one kind of struck me. And the one above it looks like that cat's a T-Rex or something eating a person. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. But so anyway. Then that, but that, so... So, yeah. So then uh, they come out of that story and she says, so they dream the world into the form it is now. And he's like, not exactly. They They dream the world so it always was that way. Yes. So it's so they kind of their dream kind of erased that that past and it, it's so it's always been this way and it kind of gives her the idea to do the same thing so yes. then that that is her mission why she is speaking to all of these cats and she talks mm-hmm. about traveling the world and it, it shows her you know scenes in different in the countryside on a ship in the city. And it's that is her mission is trying to tell all these cats to dream this reality into existence. And I, I really like the one uh, where is it where he says something about uh, trying to get um, these cats. Yeah. Uh, persuade a thousand cats to do anything at the same time will never happen. Yes. <laughs> so but yeah and i really like the artwork in this i love the shading and the line work um the the cross hatching and it look and a lot of them like the trees and everything use a lot of contour lines Mm -hmm. as opposed to like your traditional shading which i think is really neat and then all of the gravestones in the opposite directions but the lines running i just thought that was cool because you don't get that a lot in comics you get more of a well, now it's so much of it's done on the computer that you get almost yeah. where they drop the colors in and they just kind of shade them out or whatever. But this is really cool the way they yeah. cross hatch it. Well, that's uh, like I said, Kelly Jones. I mm-hmm. mean, his style is very different from most. Like when you think of art in a comic book, Kelly Jones is usually not what immediately right. comes to mind. And then, you know, some of that, like you're talking about with the cross hatching and the shading and all of that is. Uh, I mean, uh, the inker is uh, Malcolm Jones the third. So, mm-hmm. the two of them together, kind of, yeah, they give you that mm-hmm. all of the the feels there. Yeah, it's very cool. Um, no, it will never happen. <laughs> yeah. So, and then we like... end back the the kittens at home and the the couples getting ready for their day in the morning and the oh look the cat's dreaming i wonder what it's dreaming about no. it's hunting a small animal i suppose and <laughs> probably hunting a human <laughs> yeah exactly yeah honey it's really cute <laughs> planning their demise even though you can't but um, <laughs> kind of a fun ending because that's you know neil gaiman's great about that kind of thing 
bringing it back around and putting a fun little twist on it. Yeah. That was a fun, fun issue for me. Um, I mean, the story was good, but for me, the art on that one is what really shined. That's what I loved. Yeah. And speaking but, of story and art, the next issue we'll be covering probably next week is a, a Midsummer Night's Dream. So it's basically, and it's Charles Vest doing the artwork, mm-hmm. who is, man, if you don't know Charles Vest, mm-hmm. you should definitely look him up because he is amazing. Yes, this one's another beautiful one. And it's Shakespeare, so I am totally in. Love it. His style, Charles Vest is famous for, uh, he does a lot of fantasy work. So him doing mm-hmm. Midsummer Night's Dream is kind of perfect. Yeah, it is. So looks fantastic. Story's great. So everybody uh, hopefully will come back next week. What would be really cool is if we get uh, like a comic club that would read along each episode and chime in. That would be really cool. Seems like, nice. seems like we know a guy at a shop who maybe could. Do <laughs> I don't know. Okay. He's probably not watching tonight because it's his birthday, but. Yeah. Was that today? I thought that was yesterday. It no, was yesterday, today. but was it today? I think it's the 25th, right? Okay. Well, it's okay. I did it this morning, so it seems like a day ago. I'm sure he's, <laughs> he's like celebrating the whole weekend anyway. So. <laughs> All right. Well, that was look at that. We did it. We tucked it neatly under an hour, which was awesome. Talked about a lot of music, some cool comics. Next week, um, it will be Sunday or Monday. That is still up in the air, but we will be doing the new Slipknot record. Super stoked about that. Episode or issue 19 of Sandman. So if you have a chance, read Sandman number 19. I'm not you know, proposing that you go online and get it illegally, but you could, if you wanted just to follow along, <laughs> just saying, but it would well be well worth supporting Mr. Gaiman because he is an amazing guy, speaks up for schools, for literature, for literacy. Um, definitely worth supporting with your dollar. He is good people. Absolutely. Mr. Mundy. If uh, we were looking for you, I don't know on social media, where might we find you? Oh, occasionally you can find me on Instagram at Metalhead Monday, M U N D Y. That is him. We used to know this guy. I'd like <laughs> to see him again. You guys should start a campaign to get JPP back on the show. Just plain Paul.com. Start emailing him now. You can find me here. You probably don't want to, but if you did, you can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Foggy's Pal. And you can find Wanderings and Wool Gathering on YouTube, Apple Music, Spotify, Stitcher, CastBox, and SoundCloud. You know who finds us on SoundCloud? People from Russia, Ireland, and Africa right now. Careful with those people from Russia. I don't want to be accused of anything. Yeah. Well, we, got mid, we got midterm elections coming up. So. Hmm. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, so... Until next week, enjoy yourselves. Get ready for Slipknot. Read issue 19. And we will see you next Sunday or Monday. We will uh, put that out prior to that so you'll know exactly when to tune in. Bye, everybody.